Max, uh, Wigner's famous uh, comment about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics has sort of uh, come into the common parlance among scientists. But I suspect there's, there's some deep significance there. Uh, do you think so? I think the question of why mathematics is so unreasonably effective, as Wigner famously wrote, has just gotten more and more pressing and embarrassing over time. I mean, <laughs> if we think back to Galileo 400 years ago, for example, he could use math to effectively describe how a hazelnut and a grape would move if he <laughs> threw them, right? But he could not use math to figure out why one was green and one was brown, or why the hazelnut was hard and the grape was <laughs> soft. Yet later we got Maxwell's equations, which showed how you can figure out light and colors with math. And then the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics, which told us how you can figure out properties of material, like mm. hard and soft, et cetera, with, with math. And, and then we got the standard model of particle physics and the standard model of cosmology. <laughs> and by now, we have been able to apply math to almost almost all aspects of of our physical reality. And why is that? You know, there's a spectrum of, of answers. I have a number of colleagues who dismiss it as just a fluke. They're like, ah, oh, math is just a useful bag of tricks we've invented that's sort of approximately helpful, but we should be grateful for it and not talk more about why. And then you have a lot of uh, my physics colleagues who feel that uh, math is somehow a useful approximate description of our world, even though our world is still fundamentally somehow non-mathematical. And finally, on the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> where you sit, <laughs> where I sit, I have this very extreme view, taking sort of Platonism to the extreme. I think that the reason math has been so effective in describing the world is that the world is mathematical, completely mathematical. We actually inhabit a mathematical structure. And the approximations we've found so far are just some simpler math approximating you know, the actual math. And this, this sounds completely crazy when, when I say it like this, because you know, I look around myself in the world here and like, where is the math? You know, <laughs> I don't see any giant numbers written <laughs> in the sky or whatnot. But if you look a little closer, there is math all over the place. For example, the largest number of fingers I can put that are all perpendicular to each other yeah. is three. Yeah, right. That number is very built in yeah. to the fabric of, of reality. We have a nerdy name for it we made up in physics. We call it the dimensionality of space. But the name is just something we made up. This property of space is this number three. And if you look at all the elementary particles that make up everything we see right now, you know, what properties does an electron have, for example? Well, we discovered it has the property minus one, <laughs> one, <laughs> one half. And we've made up these nerdy names again for these properties, like electric charge and spin and lepton number. But those are just words we humans made up. The properties are just those numbers. And more shockingly, the only difference between an electron and an up quark and a photon and all the other particles that we have around us here are what numbers their properties are. So if you start to take seriously the idea that both space itself with its dimensionality and, and curvature and topology and other mathematical properties, and all the stuff in space, all these particles have, as far as we can tell, no properties at all except <laughs> mathematical properties, then it starts to sound a little bit less crazy that maybe it's all mathematical. And maybe this is what we have been, why it's, math has been so useful for us. So that would be, in a sense, reversing it because if math is the original, is, is the true foundation of reality, then you would be able to infer that through, ma through our simplistic math at this point, not yet the real fundamental math. How, how, would you, how would you know that? How would you know whether the equations you're working with are the real fundamental aspects of reality or are approximations? Can you say some are and some aren't? There's been... Uh a major injection of humility in physics, which I think is welcome. Uh, Steven Weinberg loves to say that every single equation that we ta were taught in our textbooks, we should view as probably just an approximation of something deeper. Mm -hmm. 
for example, when Galileo first discovered that a hazelnut thrown, you know, moves in a parabola, mm -hmm. y equals x squared, that was largely viewed as the exact truth. Parabolas are beautiful, mm -hmm. must be it. And then uh, later, it turned out, well, it's only a, a parabola if you're, if the, if it's, doesn't get really, really far away from Earth, because then it starts looking more like, uh, then you start realizing it was actually just a piece of an ellipse. <laughs> and and then Einstein came along and said, hey, wait a minute, actually even Newton's laws that gave you yeah. the ellipses aren't quite right. right. It's not actually quite an ellipse. It processes around like this, like Mercury goes around the sun mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. <clears throat> and then quantum mechanics came along and said, actually, the hazelnut doesn't even have a position and a moment <laughs> and a velocity exactly at the same time. And uh, the same has happened to, to all of those classic equations. And mm. I think it's probably fair to say that every single equation I teach in the physics courses I teach at MIT will one day be replaced by, by something else. But what they get replaced by is always a new mathematical equation. Mm. And if you look at the candidates today for a theory of everything that are supposed to replace what we have today, whether all of the competitors, string theory, loop quantum gravity, you name it, they're all just as mathematical mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As, as what came before them. Mm. So what would, be, what would be a sign? Would, would there be any, any uh, flashing neon that would say that you really got at least one equation that you could say is fundamental? Is, how would you even know that? That's the curse of physics. We can never... Mathematicians can prove that something is yeah, true. In physics, right. you can never prove right. that a theory is true. You can only prove that it's not true and reject it when you do experiments and found, find that that actually didn't work. So in, instead, what happens in physics is you have something, it's the best we got, people try their best to falsify it with clever experiments, and if a lot of talented people fail for a long time, we gradually take it more seriously. This is what's happened to quantum mechanics with its Schrodinger equation. This is what's happened to Einstein's theory of general relativity and so on. It's been really remarkable if you take the big multi-thousand year view of what's happened in physics. We went from being able to predict almost nothing with math, then we accept the motion of things. And until today, when we can predict with math almost all physical phenomena. And so instead of making a list of what you can do, which started out being just the motion of things, and then gradually you added mm -hmm. stuff to that, like light and thermodynamics and chemistry, this and that. Now you can start making a list of what is left. Uh, intelligence and consciousness, mm -hmm. basically, the inner world. And even with intelligence, we've progressed leaps and bounds where we can now have machines that can beat us at the mm -hmm. Asian board game of Go, mm -hmm. that can drive cars pretty well, and, and so on. And we've, we're realizing that the reason for this is that intelligence isn't something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms. We're rejecting carbon chauvinism, this idea that yeah, you can't be smart unless you're mm -hmm. made of carbon atoms, and, and replacing it by this idea that intelligence is all about information processing, and it doesn't matter whether the information is, is processed by carbon atoms in neurons and brains or by silicon atoms in computers or, or whatnot. It, it's ultimately just the mathematical theory of information that counts. Consciousness is the last holdout, which we have still been really, really stumped by. There are some bold people like Giulio Tononi who stick their neck out and write down equations and say, and say this is what predicts which information processing is conscious or not. I think it's going to be really valuable to try to test that and see if we can refute it or or confirm it. Um, but the prediction I'm making that it's all mathematical will be falsified if you find just one aspect of the world that you can't describe in math.